Yeah, that. Okay. I think Tansri are muted. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi Morning, everyone. Nama Muhammad Datuk Sri Mustafa Muhammad. English members of the Maria Board Trustees, Hanlis, Mr. Morita, Rapiye, Tansri Tansri, Datuk Datuk, ladies and gentlemen. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to this very important event, the Maya's webinar on visiting the public sector reform in Malaysia. But to express my deepest appreciation to Dr. Muhammad, Dr. Sri Mustafa Muhammad for taking time out from his busy schedule in gracing this event. The early initiatives of public sector reform in Malaysia, especially those in the 70s, were geared towards developing institutional capacity for undertaking routine functions of the state. The long efforts since the early 1980s have sought to strengthen service delivery and by using red tape, by streamlining the work procedures and methods. Continuous attempts have been made to improve the quality of services offered and emphasis has been put on by providing swift and free and hassle-free services to clients, including potential investors. The mission experience shows that reforms have brought about major changes to the public bureaucracy in Malaysia and its internal management. Not only have the structure of bureaucracy, processes and methods changed following reforms, market values, like quality and productivity, efficiency, discipline, innovation, integrity, 
and economy. They have also been increasingly emphasized in the public service. Although these reforms were gradually perceived as steps in the right direction and have produced favorable outcomes in several areas, there's still much to be done and to be improved in the mission public sector in its quest for achieving to achieve excellence in the public services. Clearly, there are no shortcuts. Improvement in the governance must be seen as a continuous process requiring more drives, learning and relearning, and also unlearning maybe. The most important ingredient for success in this regard is the commitment to those of those involved to make change a difference. It is encouraging to note that such commitment in Malaysia at both political and state levels remain fairly high. The light of the challenging headwinds from confronting Malaysia, both internally and externally, I believe this webinar is indeed convened and a good time to revisit public sector reform in Malaysia, to reinvigorate the reform agenda, to enable the public sector to respond better to the future needs of the rakyat, as well as increase the efficiency of state delivery. I'll be good to name but a few. I'd like to thank the fellow panelists who accepted my invitation, and in particular, uh, Dr. Ye, for, for accepting this uh, uh, invitation by my to, to chair the session. Also to thank other fellow panelists, Dr. Sharif, Dan Sri, uh, Dr. Anzar Kasim, uh, Dr. Uh, Xiao, uh, Dr. Dr. Norma, for having achieved, for having uh, accepted this invitation. On that note, I welcome all of you and wish this webinar every success. Thank you very much. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Selamat pagi, salam sejahtera dan Sri Dr. Salaman Mabub, Chairman of MIR, distinguished uh, panelists, moderator, ladies and gentlemen. It is a pleasure for me to be invited to say a few words in this MIR economic chat webinar. The Malaysian Civil Service has undergone many cycles of reforms since Merdeka. In a seminal book, The Malaysian Bureaucracy, Four Decades of, de of Development, by the late Tan Sri Abdullah Salusi Ahmad, Professor Dato Dr. Noma Manso and Dr. Abdul Kudus Ahmad, published in the year 2003, four reform measures have been highlighted. The first reform was unleashed in connection with the rural development programs of the early 1960s. The second was the launch of the new economic policy, followed by the third, associated with industrialization of the 1980s. The fourth reform was introduced in the 1990s, which was motivated by the growth of information and communications technology, or ICT. However, despite our best intentions, issues which are, which are related particularly to poor implementation have in inhibited success. The constants change, and the public sector cannot afford to remain unchanged. The environment in which governments operate has become increasingly dynamic and unpredictable. New competencies and adaptation skills for administrators in the public sector are needed. We need to continue upgrading the critical leadership skills among civil servants who could guide future generations in a pathway towards better governance, sustainable growth and inclusive socio-economic development. Public expectations of government delivery and performance are higher now than ever before as we move up the income ladder. Our ministries and agencies must continue to focus on delivering services more efficiently. Ladies and gentlemen, since the emergence of COVID-19, tremendous pressure has been placed on the shoulders of our civil servants. Despite these challenges, our response has been good overall, and we must pay tribute to the excellent work of our medical and non-medical frontliners. In the 12th Mission Plan, a number of initiatives will be introduced to build an effective and accountable public sector to meet rising expectations due to the advancements in technology as well as the growing middle class and population dynamics. Three focus areas have been highlighted by the government to achieve this vision. Firstly, the management of talent. Although the performance of our civil servants is at par with most of our regional peers, Malaysia needs to undertake a number of fundamental reforms to meet our aspirations of becoming a high-income nation. The, pub the public sector needs to nurture and attract high-performing and future-ready civil servants. Being equipped with the relevant tools, leadership skills, as well as having strong values and ethics will bring about quality services and enhance confidence in our public service. Secondly, in ensuring that the government is continuously riot-centric 
in its day-to-day -day operations, efforts will be undertaken to transform the public service through whole-of-government approach. Focus has been given to improving operational efficiency, promoting innovation, and strengthening the governance ecosystem. Thirdly, the key performance indicators or KPIs of civil servants will be improved to enhance the effectiveness of programs and project implementation as well as to ensure efficiency of public service delivery in achieving good governance the organizational management and digitalization of services by ministries will be evaluated through the malaysian government performance index or my gpi ladies and gentlemen the civil service is very dear to me in my 48 years of public service i've had the privilege and honor to work with some of the best and brightest of Malaysian civil servants. I have witnessed the evolution of the civil service firsthand. This is not to say, however, that everything is fine with us. This is why this webinar is useful for all of us. We should continue to enhance the quality and performance of our civil service and be better than our regional peers. I hope all of you will have frank and honest discussions on the state of our civil service in the next couple of hours. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam, alaikum salam wa barakatuh. I must just say my thanks and appreciation to the staff for having appreciated our function. Um, let me now um, introduce our moderator, that is Dr. Ye Kim Ling. He's a professor of economics, and director of economic studies program, Jeffrey Chia Institute in South Asian Studies at Sun University since May 2016, holding a two year stint as a business, a business school dean at another private university, Kuala Lumpur. Prior to that, Dr. Ye spent over 20 years in the private sector, principally as the chief economist in the country's domestic trading credit rating agency or grant. Dr. Yeh obtained his MBA in 1988 and PhD in agricultural and resource economics in 1992 from the University of Hawaii on the USA under the East-West Center degree program. He's currently the deputy president of the Nation Economic Association and has served as an external member of the Central Bank's Monetary Policy Committee, a member of the National Consumer Investment Council, and trustee of the Mission Tax Research I must thank Dr. for accepting this invitation. He's a close friend of mine, and uh, I'm sure he will be able to guide the function uh, effectively. Thank you, Dr. Yeah, thank, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tan Sri. Uh, I think this is a wonderful opportunity uh, to be a moderator for this economic chat that uh, with what, we, what I would call a, a dream panel. Uh, comprising a former top civil servant with extensive uh, experience in leading GLCs as well as statutory bodies. We also have a leading management consultant. Uh, I would call him the, perhaps the country's uh, topmost consultant in management uh, that is, who, who is also involved uh, in public sector reforms, and that's very important. Uh, we also have a very highly uh, accomplished uh, academician with, uh, uh, with, with, who has contributed tremendously to public policy discussion. And then finally, we have a leading industry captain. I'm sure you all know who I'm, I'm referring to. Now, just, just to kick off the, the, the economic chat, let me just uh, briefly outline what I think is uh, critical, how critical the public sector is. Now, the public sector over the last five years uh, con contributed on average 18.5% uh, uh, to the country, country's GDP. Now, of course, uh, the size is not just, uh, it's important, it's not just the size, but importantly, the extent that the public sector plays in the country's uh, development goals and aspirations in terms of meet, achieving them. Now, we know that uh, reforms uh, leading to a more efficient and effective public sector will help to help the country, in fact, to achieve its potential growth, which, which we currently estimate at around four to five percent. Now, there, there, there are dynamic gains to increasing public sector efficiency in the sense of promoting uh, what we call the stronger, uh, raising the country's potential growth. And that is what we are interested in, in terms of 
realizing the dynamic efficiency gains from higher public sector, uh, both in terms of quality and efficiency, as we have seen in many developed countries. It is the highly developed public institutions that is driving the economy. And uh, we estimate that uh, the country's potential growth can be raised by between one to two percentage points easily uh, through public sector uh, improvements in terms of invigorating private investment and entrepreneurial activities, in terms of building new markets as the concept of an entrepreneur state. And the concept of entrepreneur state is also critical in terms of mobilizing the public private partnership in terms of, uh, to, 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 to strengthen the country's growth foundation. And then importantly, uh, the uh, stronger public sector will also help to accelerate the shift uh, from a low to high value uh, economy. Now, as uh, the minister has mentioned, public sector reform is not something new, uh, but importantly, we have to recognize that if we do not un undertake so-called incremental reforms, we may, uh, face a situation whereby when the backs are to the wall, as what we have experienced during the early 80s, the mid 80s, where the fiscal deficit rose up to high, a high of 17, 18% of GDP. And that's when a contraction in the public spending and uh, public sector reforms led to a, a, a downturn. And then following the Asian financial crisis, we have a slew of uh, public sector as well as financial sector reforms that led to a fairly strong uh, performance in the 90s and the 2000s. So this time around, uh, the nation is faced with a, a slew of uh, post-COVID development issues and challenges. So it's very timely to have uh, more public discussions and inputs. Uh, as mentioned earlier, our four panelists uh, assembled by MIER all have very vast experiences, expertise and insights to share on this topic of public sector reforms. Uh, each panelist will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes and we will have about 15 minutes for questions and answers at the end. So online participants, you're welcome to post your questions on the chat box. And then of course, uh, the organizer, because of this uh, complexity and the interest on this topic, uh, it's very wide ranging. So the organizing secretariat has allowed some flexibility in extending the session. So for those, uh, if we go over the schedule, Please bear with us, uh, depending on how we proceed in terms of answering some of the questions and, and answers. So it's now my pleasure to invite our first panelist, uh, Yang Bahagia, uh, Tan Sri Dato Muhammad Sharif Kasim, to share his uh, perspectives on public sector reforms. Tan Sri was formerly the direct, Director General of the Economic Planning Unit and later the Secretary General of the Ministry of Finance. Besides his uh, distinguished government service, he was chairman of several companies, including Standard Chartered Bank and uh, Plus Brahat. He also has a sting in as a managing director of uh, the Soron Wealth Fund, Kazana Brahat. And he, he, he is also the past uh, chairman of uh, MIER, as well as uh, past president of the Malaysian Economic Association, and also a G25 founding member. So Tan Sri, uh, welcome. Uh, yeah, we'd like to hear your... <laughs> Your, your, your esteemed views and perspectives as well as your insights in terms of uh, both in terms your past experience in running the government, the Ministry of Finance and EPU, and also your private sector experience in the various uh, GLCs. Over to you, Tan Sri. Uh, thank you very much. <clears throat> Good morning to all who are listening to us today. First of all, I would like to thank MIR uh, in particular, Tan Sri Dr. Sleman for inviting me uh, to thank uh, Professor Dr. Ye Kim Leng for moderating the session. Um, I'm particularly pleased to be talking today because uh, I was involved with MIER as Professor Ye mentioned. I was the chairman at one time after Tan Sri Basel. Uh, <clears throat> let me proceed. Uh, the minister was saying that he hoped we will conduct this uh, discussion in a frank and open manner. So I will take that as an uh, indication that uh, we can be quite 
open in our discussion today. Um, but considering the time, I'll, I'll, I'll try to be as fast as possible. Um, first of all, I think we should all know that, that the, when we use the term public sector is, a, is very large. The public sector in Malaysia is very large. It comprises the federal government, the state governments, the local authorities, statutory bodies, and also GLCs. Um, one measure of the size of the public sector is if you look at the national accounts statistics, which shows that uh, the total public sector investment accounts for about what, 50 to 60% of total investment. In the old days, I think it was just around about 30%. So in the last 30 years, the public sector has expanded tremendously. Some of it is quite justified because, you know, the government wants to expedite the development of the country. So you have to build, you spend more money on infrastructure, on schools, hospitals, roads, railways. Um, so that's okay. But I think the big issue with the, the public sector is there is over concentration of power at the center. Uh, and uh, very often you hear about the bureaucratic delays and inefficiencies. Only yesterday, you know, at a, at a board meeting, they were talking about the housing project that they were doing. Uh, so apart from dealing with the state authorities, local authorities, the Ministry of Housing also has its own uh, rules and regulations. So that is perhaps a big, uh, a, a good indicator of what over centralization means. Despite various le levels of uh, government, the center in KL holds a big power. So I think one big reform that uh, we should look at is uh, decentralization of uh, power in decision making. And I think uh, apart from reducing, uh, apart from uh, promoting efficiency, I think decentralization to me will also help to reduce the favoritism, nepotism and corruption, which is associated with too much political power at the center. Um, another reform uh, is, of course, institutional governance. Uh, and I will focus, uh, my focus on you know, high priority reform is parliament and the judiciary. Uh, these two institutions are very important to provide the checks and balance on the executive branch of government. The legislative branch of government are parliament and the judiciary. The executive branch of government is the cabinet. I think if you look at the advanced democracies, Australia, UK, US, they are parliamentary checks and on checks and balance is very, very strong. Uh, of course, together with uh, empowering parliament, uh, the reform should also empower civil society organizations and the media. Uh, these are part of the United Nations Human Rights Convention. But uh, I think in Malaysia, uh, we are still uh, not in full compliance. For example, we have restrictive laws on the uh, print and uh, electronic media. And now I come to the civil service proper. <clears throat> uh, 
um, you hear 1.6 million government employees or public sector employees. Sometimes I hear 1.7 million. I'm not sure which one is correct. But of course, not all are white collar civil servants. Uh, there are many, um, about a million of them are counted for by the education sector, the health sector, the professional services, uh, like you know, lawyer, uh, judicial service, the uh, uh, yeah, various services, the police, the military. So even after taking into account the balance would be you know the normal general the 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 general administrative and civil service. <clears throat> Uh, we have the top echelon, you know, which are the, the leaders, and then we have the supporting staff. Um, the key issue uh, in every discussion on this subject is, of course, to improve efficiency and productivity through greater use of technology and digitalization. Uh, I know Pomuda has done a lot of this in the past. Uh, so today, there are some departments which are really good at the counter services in land, you income tax, road tax, immigration, they are much, much faster than before. But I think we have to uh, make this uh, broader uh, to cover all sections of the civil service, uh, especially those involved in, in providing public services. Um, the size of the civil service, and some say it's appropriate, some say it's too big, some say it's too small. But whatever it is, you have to note that you know they account for forty-five percent of the operating expenditure, salaries and pensions. Salaries and pensions account for about forty-five percent of the operating budget of the federal government. Uh, they are taking into account statutory payments like debt servicing and statutory grants to state governments. Uh, there is not much left in the operating expenditure for you know, uh, maintenance of uh, public facilities. Um, so, but another important thing about salaries and uh, amendments is that this has been growing faster than revenue. If you look at the average growth rate over the last 10 years, uh, salaries and pensions have been growing at a faster rate. Now, of course, some people say, okay, what's the problem? Let's increase revenue by taxing more. But there are limits uh, to which you can tax. Uh, direct taxation, you know, especially company income tax, you have to take into account of the regional competition. When you come to indirect taxation, you can see how sensitive GST was. Uh, I personally think it was a mistake to abolish it. We need the GST to strengthen the tax system. But whatever we do on the revenue side, the fact is that you know we have to also reduce on the expenditure or on the civil service. Um, so, I think uh, this, of course, has to be done in stages. You cannot suddenly cut down the site. That's not practical. So, I think what we should do is also uh, try to introduce some measures which are already in practice in the private sector. For example, non-performers should be offered early retirement. Uh, I was in the Standard Chartered Bank. <laughs> I could see, you know, the as branch banking became less and less necessary with uh, with modern technology, branch bank. So they needed less staff, so they had to they had to ask some of the excess staff to leave. But they this staff live with a uh, what do you call that uh, compensation, yeah. And many are in plus who did that. Mass did that. So 
and sometimes the staff are quite happy to leave if, if they get uh, the the compensation they go and use the money and go and find and do some other things uh, then of course promotions and recruitment should be based on merit irrespective of race and religion uh, I also think that it's time we should think about decentralizing of public services to state governments and local authorities. But you can't do that if the state's revenue is very weak. So even in those days when I was with the EPU, we had studies, we did propose you know, about strengthening the or giving the state a higher proportion of the revenue share of the country. And this is done in the United States. And they, they have the sales tax also, but a portion of the tax goes to state governments, not the federal government doesn't take everything. Um, if they have a better, bigger share of the federal revenue, federal allocation, federal revenue allocation, but they can do much more on their own on, for drainage and irrigation. Uh, they can implement measures on how to deal with natural disasters, on public health problems. Um, I mean, we can see in the recent flood situation, you know, where uh, local authority of state waiting for the federal, federal waiting for the state. I think we shouldn't have that. Uh, we should empower the state to have the authority and the financial resources to deal with uh, problems at the grassroots level. Um, of course, with this, this, with decentralization and giving more powers to states, we can reduce staff at the federal level. Federal ministries should concentrate on the big, the big function, functions level. Uh, to me, the big functions are on planning and coordination. Coordination. Uh, that's, for example, planning and, and coordination of economic priorities between sectors, states, and regions. Uh, defense and internal security of the, obviously these are federal matters, foreign affairs. Um, so with, the, with this uh, decentralization, uh, operational ministries can be limited, can be reduced in number. Now we have so many. Um, I think we have about 40 or how many ministries? 40 or 30 ministries. Now. Too many to count. Uh, now, statutory bodies and GLCs. The idea of setting up the GLCs and certain bodies is that they should be self-governing. Of course, they are implement. They are they are what you call that special agencies attached to ministries. But the trouble is that there's too much ministerial and political interference. So. As suggested by civil society organizations, I think we should put all sector bodies and DLCs under the purview of the parliamentary select committee. Uh, so as to take them out of the responsibility of ministers and civil servants. Um, each statutory body or each DLC should be required to submit quarterly or half yearly or annual report to the parliamentary select committee. They can discuss this. Uh, and then this way, uh, the GLCs will become more transparent and accountable to the public. Um, and there are also Statutory bodies and GRCs, which may not be relevant anymore. Some are very important. We must have them for strategic reasons. Because, for example, like the GLCs under Fazana, most of them are very strategic to the country. 
power, uh, telecommunications, uh, telecommunication, uh, uh, yeah, telecommunication power. Uh, those are uh, essential. Those are essential, and also you know, Kazana is also promoting cutting edge technologies to take Malaysia to a higher level of uh, technology development. Those are very important. But those that are no longer serve their purpose, they should be reviewed, especially those who are not able to be financially uh, self-reliant. I think it's, uh, uh, they should be reviewed and if necessary, uh, they should be phased out. I know in Kazana, uh, they were identifying companies which you can they could they could sell off to uh, Bumi Putra entrepreneurs. I think uh, uh, other major DLCs should follow the same example as said by Kazana. Maybe I have uh, I don't know. Uh, if yes. I take yeah, it out I my time. Yes. <laughs> oh, but it's you. okay. We can we can continue uh, perhaps after the. Oh, oh yeah, I, think I, I, should, I should stop. Okay, thank thank you, Tansri. I think your 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 remarks have been very wide ranging, covering many issues from uh, decentralization to streamlining the GLCs, and also importantly, uh, to take note of the the fact that uh, the size of the both the investment as well as the operating expenditure of the government has reached a stage whereby it has now about equal the revenue. So we have, we have hardly any primary surplus left for development expenditure and all that had to be funded. We are, uh, we are borrowing. So thanks, thank, thank you, Tansri. Uh, we'll come back to some of the issues that you have raised, especially on the part about uh, the, the pendulum has swing uh, from decentralization now to over centralization. So how do we strike a balance in terms of ensuring that we have optimal optimal point in terms of ensuring that over centralization do not result in in uh, in all this uh, so called these uh, the negative effects of, uh, of uh of concentration of power versus the fact that when you over decentralize you may lose lose the overall direction as well as uh, leading to so called abuse of power at the decentralized level see? so that could be another another issue to to look at when we swing too much to one direction uh, let, let me now to come to the second panelist, uh, Dr. Hamza Kasim. He's the co-founder of IA Group, one of the country's uh, foremost uh, management consulting company. Dato, Dr. Hamza has over 35 years of consulting experience in leading large-scale strategy business uh, and, and, and uh, strategy business and uh, uh, let me see, my notes <laughs> disappeared. <laughs> Uh, strategy business as, as well as IT transformation and then importantly, uh, public sector transformation across industries as well as uh, sectors and in different countries. Dr. Dr. Hamza is also a member of the National Economic Advisory Council and he, he, he had also participate, participated in crafting the new economic model as well as a member of the special task force chaired by the Prime Minister in the implementation of nine Malaysia plan. He is currently the chairman of uh, Hong Leong Islamic Bank Advisory Board member, as well as uh, um, a board member of the Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission and a member of MIER's uh, Board of Trustees. Having conducted uh, transformation programs for both the private sector and the public sector, let us now hear from Dr. Dr. Hamza what he thinks are the reform challenges and what, what can or should be done to ensure the success of our uh, public sector uh, quest to improve the service quality and de delivery uh, objectives. Over to you, Dato. I knew that this thing. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Professor uh, for the introduction. And um, currently, I will be wearing my hat as a board of trustee of MIR to. Uh, to be also contribute to this uh, economic chat. Um, there are many issues that we need to, to discuss. Uh, what I will uh, touch on the topic is, uh, let me see why my slides are moving. 
uh, we always have this problem when we are on flight. Uh, okay. Um, I will cover three areas. One is public, uh, public sector reform uh, driven by economic imperative. Uh, we, we have to look at, at the end of the day, uh, the outcome of any reform is to accelerate growth and you know, soften the major issues of uh, inequality, uh, stagnant wages, and we need to be able to uh, redesign our reform agenda to drive uh, the economic uh, agenda. The number two is the key challenges facing the public sectors. Some of the key challenges, um, not only in Malaysia, but many other countries. Uh, the, the World Bank uh, report recently on aiming highs also indicate that uh, Malaysia uh, has to improve its uh, delivery and policy and modernize institution. And the, the last one is the 10 essential of public sector reform, because I will cover on governance, because governance of reform is very important. And for the last 10, 15 years, uh, you know, uh, we have many blueprints of reform um, and it's always uh, the execution is the key. And uh, we, when Prof. Norma and I was involved in the NAC, there are many strategic initiatives, but the challenge uh, is that, you know, uh, reform is a very cumbersome uh, and is very complex. Uh, and the whole policy cycle can take from one to five years of implementation. So the, I will touch on why implementation matters in, in really executing reform. So uh, going back to the economic imperative, if we look at what we are facing uh, uh, for the last uh, many years, uh, 1998 uh, was a major uh, crisis. We, we feel the 98 financial crisis, uh, you know, looking at MIR um, uh, chart, um, this dip has uh, left us with a very uh, uh, big scar uh, with the collapse of FDIs, and we were not able to you know, recover the 9% or 8% that we used to have pre-crisis. And we are moving, you know, and growth to a certain extent is deaccelerating, and it, it, it caused a huge uh, impact to, to the economy, to job creation, and also in, in growing the new sectors. Uh, the recent crisis is also uh, another dip. And, and we need to also look at uh, what sort of scar we, uh, you know, we are going to have in, in the recovery and uh, economic recovery with Nancy uh, Slyman is also the executive director of the recovery. And, and the new economic model that came in 2011 uh, was about to drive the new, uh, the, the innovation driven economic model, which is supposed to, uh, um, um, enable us to achieve the high income in 2020. Now it looks that, you know, that vision has not been achieved. And uh, what I've seen is that, or what I've heard is that, uh, this is going to be sort of postponed to 2028 or 2026. We don't know how far we can achieve that, uh, that um, the goal that we set up as a uh, 2020 vision. So economic uh, uh, imperative is very key. If we don't do the, uh, if we look at the 1998 crisis, uh, we probably have taken some structural reform, but not, uh, you know, uh, tough enough to uh, drive the economic change uh, in Anna with a still a low cost model, economic model. And now the government has launched a digitalization uh, initiative to, to move us to the digital economy. So uh, reform in, in, in is very key now in terms of driving whether we could achieve the 12 Malaysia plan target uh, that is uh, pending on the way we implement some of the administrative and uh, public sector reform. Uh, if you look worldwide, you know, there is a big diversion between, you know, administrative uh, complexity and also capacity. Uh, the diversion of public sector, all, you know, not Malaysia alone, we have seen the complexity of uh, governance has gone up very fast. And we have, uh, and look at the last, last three years of the uh, COVID, which, uh, you know, we don't expect uh, such an uh, event to happen. And, you know, when you are in the bank, uh, and I, uh, I mean, we work in the bank and we always, you know, keep us awake is what are the risks that affect the economy and the financial system. And uh, some of these uh, black swan, you know, like uh, even the war in Ukraine is, is, a, is another black swan that is also uh, causing, you know, a, a disruption in supply chain. And the COVID also uh, is a, is a, uh, is the, you know, it's a COVID driven economic crisis. So uh, the government was, uh, was able, uh, 
able to respond to this, but you require a whole of government approach, uh, you know, and you see the different uh, uh, challenges of getting, you know, the local government, the state government and the federal government to work uh, uh, in, in the same direction to resolve some of the serious crisis that we, uh, economic crisis that we have uh, in the last uh, in the last two years, and also, not, uh, the, in fact, the COVID is still around, and uh, this continuing crisis require the uh, the agility of the civil service and new capability to handle this crisis. So the urgent need for realignment is, you know, is all about the socioeconomic challenges that we are facing today. Uh, you, every other day, you find the EPF. You know, uh, government is still helping the bottom forty percent. Uh, the growing inequality uh, is a challenge uh, for the country. The other one is of the, our health system, our education system are uh, very important to, to be able to uh, meet some of this uh, growing uh, uh, transition. Uh, and uh, as we, the economy uh, in terms of moving to the digital economy is equally important. Um, uh, many other countries uh, and the emergence of you know new technologies of uh, of uh, blockchain, uh, data analytics, and all this thing has impact on the way uh, we run the government. And those new technology can accelerate the efficiency of government if we have uh, if we can embrace that uh, and use those tools and methodology to do predictive analysis on how to manage you know the different crises that we are meeting. Um, and that we have seen in the last uh, two years, uh, digitization has been accelerated, uh, which mm -hmm. I think many of the sectors of the financial industry has been trying very hard, but the two years have seen a major acceleration of digitalization, but the government to a certain extent is not ready uh, to embrace uh, the new way of working. Uh, and that's require a huge uh, uh, overhaul of the way, uh, the whole operating model of government in order to you know to work from home and to uh, to make sure that the whole digitalization is is accelerated, and that is in line with the my digital blueprint, and also delivery challenges which the government facing today. Uh, there are many challenges uh, because, as you know, government worked uh, uh, in, in in silos, uh, and uh, the whole of government approach has always been uh, uh, a vision of every countries around the world to make sure that. Um, um, agencies can work together to collaborate, to deliver their services. And um, uh, one is the, you know, uh, we are rule bound, the ministry structure is very rule bound, and they are very, and also very passive uh, public, uh, public participation in certain uh, area. Uh, the uh, community engagement is not as good in some uh, advanced economy. And still output driven, although the, the, the government, the MOF has introduced the, uh, what we call the outcome based uh, budgeting, um, the government is still to a certain extent that has not been quite uh, pervasive. Uh, so outcome uh, based and uh, is, uh, uh, is very important uh, to move the government to the next level of uh, ability to manage this, uh, this uh, reform. Um, also the rising expectation of the citizen and investors you know, citizens are quite smart today uh, with the social media. They can voice, you know, uh, whatever dissatisfaction in real time. So, so they are huge demand for the, for the, for the citizen in terms of making sure that the service, uh, service delivery is at par because many of them have traveled around the world. They make comparison to, as, uh, to uh, you know, regional or in other countries, how things are handled. Although you know we have improved quite tremendously in the last uh, you know thirty years uh, through many of the uh, uh, government e-government, but moving to the next level require uh, further investment in capacity. So investors also is um, uh, knowing that you know uh, FDIs is quite important. It drives the whole economic growth. So we need to move quite fast into this uh, area. So execution engine is even critical in in moving this. Uh, this needle of economic uh, transformation because we have seen uh, many countries uh, or we have prepared blueprint in higher education and education in many other uh, new new initiative but the execution in engine is something that we have to look in terms of the governance of the reform so without a strong governance of the reform you know whatever uh, uh, aspiration that the government have in the draft plan or in, in, in its uh, uh, 
vision or blueprint will not be able to deliver the outcome. And as we see, the policy cycle of, of making reform is long. It could be from one year to five years. And, and I have worked in many of these projects, sometimes even five, six years, because from, from right to design to execution, rolling up, and also managing the chain, and until the legislation has been approved, it's a very long process. So we, we, we have to figure out in a better way of uh, a better to, way to institutionalize the governance of, 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 uh, of reform. So uh, coming to the final slide, you know, uh, as uh, I want to look at the, some of the uh, essential of, of, uh, uh, of public sector reform. So the economic, social, political chain, uh, you know, uncertainty, volatility uh, will impact the way we operate in the future. And it is very important for government to look what are the future operating model. What we have built for the last 20, 30 years have done a good uh, job in delivering where we are, but in moving to the next stage of, uh, of, of uh, advancement and economic uh, progress will require us to modernize our institution. And we look at, you know, uh, that we need to redesign uh, and re-engineer some of our institution as, uh, as the earlier speaker was saying, there's a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, we need merger integration and overlappingness of, of, of uh, functions. So public sector reform, uh, many complexities, cross-casting issues and coordination and, and participating several uh, institutions. So, so this is important as stated in the 12 Malaysia plan, the whole of government approach. Uh, it requires because one uh, initiative or four initiatives in reform uh, cut across many institutions. And you know, it's not easy to get every institution to, to agree because they are vested interests in different parties uh, to, to also protect their turf. So you require a strong governance uh, in terms of implementation, the whole of government approach. The third one is capability development. We know that the skill, the competency that we have today will not be enough to bring us to the next level. You know, so we need to upgrade competency across the board of the government. That means relooking at the role of the current institute training institution that can bring new, new competency and capability that can help to re-engineer the government processes. So some of the skill sets uh, that we have uh, are quite fine, but uh, in order to take a more complex uh, reform, the policy instrument, the right time to intervene, to intervene, which part of the policy instrument can uh, we need to use at the intervention of, of this change. So, uh, so a student in public policy and, and will, will understand the, uh, you know, the sort of intervention required to make change in the whole cycle of reform. The readiness to change, number four is, we need to institutionalize the culture of change and innovation. And, uh, and the mindset on like the entrepreneurial state as, as, uh, as the, 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 our, our moderator was talking about, you know, there are countries who are moving to the entrepreneurial state. That means they are adopting best practice from the private sector to drive changes. So the readiness to change and work new ways and also adopt best practice in, 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 uh, in the way we run our government is, is uh, very critical. And that requires a lot of uh, upgrading of our, our uh, development institution and particularly people, people capability upgrading is very crucial to drive this. And many transformation reforms fail, not of anything, not because of, uh, you know, it's all about the way, uh, the ability of the people to drive this chain right from the, from the federal to the district level. So sequencing of transformation is equally important. We need to prioritize, you know, we cannot do all, but we need to look what is the most important impact that we can uh, select those reforms that will deliver the economic outcome. If economic outcome in terms of growth is very critical to the country because we have fiscal space, we have problem with our fiscal uh, space and you know revenue. So we can identify uh, what are the major institutions that need to be reformed that will drive uh, economic outcome and also drive uh, revenue and cutting costs of government. So the sequencing of the reform is very important and that's why you know, uh, sitting down and prioritize is crucial for the government to do that and focus on policy delivery and outcome. And uh, so the policy delivery is a, is a, is a very, very important uh, uh, instrument. So we need to show that, you know, whatever policy, even one in the, when we look at the new economic model, there are many strategic initiatives, which Prof. Norma will, will, will touch. And just to get one or three or four initiatives to roll out will take 
take a long uh, process. So the policy delivery require capability at the civil service to understand the dynamics of policy analysis, uh, data analytics, and also to, uh, to look at the unintended consequences of these policies um, and the policies and transformation. So we need to get buying in because political cost of reform is high. If you look at GST alone, uh, it's a good uh, example of, you know, GST was, was important with financial reform because it took 20 years for the government to agree on uh, GST. And, you know, when there's a political change, uh, you know, the reform has been, you know, reversed. So, so many uh, changes can be at risk when they are uh, changed in the government. So we, we need to understand the cost of this reform and we need to make sure that there's continuity in spite of leadership uh, change. And the engine of execution, as I said earlier, is program and project management. We need an institutional framework for execution and implementation. In other countries, uh, you know, the thought leadership was strong in terms of, you know, like public service commission, independent commission that look overall reform. So here, we, I'm not sure which uh, agencies are taking uh, ownership in driving and execution of reform. And, and that's why parliament is also important. So, so we need different layers of governance uh, from parliament right to agencies to be able to drive this reform. We are serious to execute. Otherwise, uh, you know, this reform has been uh, spoken over the last, you know, uh, 10 plan, 11 plan. And, you know, although we have achieved some progress, what we need is a strong institutional framework that can drive reform, uh, you know, and oversee and also make sure that regular monitoring and, and, and reporting. Um, and I was at the government before, you know, we, we have a, uh, in the early uh, 90s, you know, there's strong, uh, you know, cabinet committee that look over, you know, specific areas of reform and quarterly report to the cabinet committee chaired by the prime minister. So uh, that sort of government is very formed. And then the case of change. So all the government servants must believe that reform is good for them. Uh, we need to be sure that the messaging is right because it's not about downsizing government. It's about you know, creating a more efficient government, more uh, responsive government, uh, and, and government that you know, can adapt and agile to changing circumstances. So a committee engagement, the citizen must be involved in the design of, 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 the, of the reform. So, and you know, my last two minutes is uh, you know, it's about uh, building the ecosystem that will bring experts, scholars in key areas to be part of the process. Because as I say, this is a multidisciplinary uh, uh, approach. We need uh, socioeconomic, we need people uh, in, in, uh, in data analytics, in digital, in, in financial system, in public finance, in budget. So uh, it's all very important. To, to be able to mobilize the, 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 the expert or the uh, you know, people who like Tansi Sharif and Tansi Sulaiman and, and also the younger emerging generation who are coming out from universities who are, uh, who are specialized in public policies, be able to bring those scholars uh, uh, and, uh, and experts to be part of this movement to drive reform. So these are essential and so it's about collaboration with the best in class. So I'd like to just um, you know, uh, end this by saying that uh, to me, number one is uh, economic imperative is very important to drive uh, important uh, uh, you know, drivers of reform. Number two, the current, uh, you know, uh, uh, what we are facing today, uh, a, lot of, a lot of pressures from different uh, sectors uh, uh, and crises that is always uh, ongoing ongoing crisis, that uh, this is a period of ongoing crisis. We don't know the next, uh, the next crisis will be cyber threat or, you know, we, don't, we can't predict those, but we have to be well prepared. And that prepared, preparedness require a, a, a machinery that are able to respond to these changes. And the third point I want to emphasize is about the governance of reform and the success and failures of reform is about governance. And that governance requires a dedicated institution, a strong level of government and accountability right to the cabinet and, and to parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dato. That's a very comprehensive lecture on, on the fundamental principles or rationale. And then importantly, uh, that's uh, uh, the, the, the need to ensure a holistic approach or what we call whole of government or uh, a holistic and, uh, and, and, and whole of society kind of approach to tackling reforms. 
we certainly agree with you that uh, reform is very complex, multifaceted, and then importantly, it's uh, require a lot of behavioral change and uh, raising of uh, organizational capabilities and competency. So thank you, thank you, Tato. Uh, that's a, 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 a great uh, coverage of this uh, reform that we need in order to achieve our success to be a high income nation by at least by 2025 or 2026, uh, based on the projections by the World Bank. Uh, but certainly, the, the, if you are able to achieve what you have uh, laid out for us in terms of adopting some of the 10 principles and all that, so certainly we would be nearer to our goal of uh, attaining a uh, uh, developed nation status. Yeah, uh, uh, Dr. Yeah. Just ahead, that I forgot to say, but you know, what bring here uh, will not bring us, us to the next level. I mean, what we, you know, all the institutions that we have built over the last 20, 30 years mm. will not be able to bring us to the next stage until we change all this. Yes. Yeah, it's a very fascinating. And uh, of course, uh, given the time constraint, we are not <laughs> able to yeah. go deeper into it. But nevertheless, we have two more panelists. Our third panelist is a professor emeritus, Dr. Norma Manso, highly acclaimed academician, as well as an advisor and consultant to numerous local and international institutions such as the World Bank, UNDP, OECD, and uh, European Union. Dr. Norma is currently the Director of Social Wellbeing Research Center at uh, University of Malaya, as well as the, she is also the current president of the Malaysian Economic Association. Before heading SWRC, she was the Dean of the Faculty of Economics and Administration at University of Malaya. She had served as a Secretary of the National Economic Advisory Council in the Prime Minister Department. So the floor is yours, Tato. Thank you so much, uh, Prof. Ye. I'm aware of the time constraints, so um, I'm getting someone to time me here so that uh, I'm keeping to time. Uh, but first of, of all, allow me to thank uh, the MIER for the invitation for, uh, for us to be part of this chat. Yeah. Um, and as uh, Prof. Ye mentioned, that I, I, would, um, I can't move away from my old uh, role as the um, secretary to the um, National Economic Advisory Council. Therefore, we speak from where NEM, uh, um, and we've, we did a very comprehensive uh, uh, engagement as well as looking at past policies on how do we unlock the value drivers. Yeah, As Prof. Ye mentioned, that the public sector uh, uh, as the facilitative and also the steering, not, not driving the economy, steering the economy uh, into the right direction and also steering towards growth is key in, in, um, in uh, the development of the country. So um, that efficiency would be, uh, in, in my view, um, at least uh, uh, four broad areas that was mentioned by the NEM. Uh, first of all, it's about the bureaucratic re reforms. And in my view, um, I would go back to the traditional definition of the public sector, yeah, of the uh, public bureaucracy. What is the role of the bureaucracy? The role of the bureaucracy is of two things. Yeah? The facilitative role is about getting the right ecosystem for the private sector to thrive. And the second role is to, serve, to, to service the people or service delivery, to, to ensure that the well being of the people is cared for. Yeah? So, the, the raison d'etre or the reason for being of the public sector has to be reminded. And I think in the uh, NEM, we, did, we, we proposed how this can be, as mentioned by Dato Hamza, that we have played that role very well and captured in the book. Uh, uh, mentioned by the minister uh, as well. We have done very well until the 1980s and into the 90s. We learn from the expansion of the public sector uh, uh, during of, from 1970s to 1980s, and then we try to reduce the role uh, by pay, and, and we were in great debt, and that caused us the 1980s crisis, yeah? the, the problem that we were in then. And we were able to bring back uh, the so-called the, the role of public sector to facilitate, but we also went to be involved in some of the sectors. So that's where now we have to reevaluate and see whether though playing that role, participating, um, having the GLCs, are we overdoing, or as we mentioned in the NEM, 
we have to, to relook and, and re review uh, some of these uh, uh, sectors that we are in. The second role is the facilitating role, or uh, sorry, service delivery, which is the bit to the right. Yeah, yeah. The first role is to the business, that how do we support business? I think that the NDC I will speak more about this, but the role of ensuring regulations are complied, but over-regulation and not managing regulations between the three levels of government can be problematic. And my understanding, while we were doing the engagement for the new economic model, we understand that the, there, there are over 100, for instance, 100 rules and regulations or licenses and procedures that will have to be approved in order to start a business depending on which sector. And some changes, some improvements have been made, but more has to be done. The, what is uh, desired at the federal level is not necessarily met or understood or uh, um, participated at the lowest level. Yeah? So businesses, uh, uh, when, when you want to invest or open a business, face a lot of irregularities or inconsistencies yeah, for instance, it's as simple as how far the, the uh, electric post should be from your company. You know, you go to one local council, it will say this far, and you go to another council, it will, it will give another dimension. So that is one role to, to, to support business. And uh, with regards to service delivery, the digitalization has enabled many services to be conducted. However, there are more to be done where sometimes the information does not get to the people, the, the, the people who are supposed to benefit from those services. Um, I'm talking about how social protection, we have tried to improve on money fronts of social protection, but sometimes the people who are supposed to gain from it do not even know that they are entitled to those services. So being there, being down there, uh, uh, serving the rakyat, I think, uh, uh, going to the people, not necessarily getting people to come to, to the government offices, as we have mentioned in, on many occasions, is not necessarily the best way to serve the rakyat. Yeah? The digitalization, I understand that uh, in the uh, 12th uh, plan document, is about 78.8% of our uh, government services are available online. And end-to-end -end is about 50%. So more has to be done. Uh, we talked about with Andy, and Andy will share more about this, that how certain uh, um, regulations, for instance, uh, on land uh, conversion or land uh, um, titles, yeah, could be digitalized and, and uh, um, certain uh, safeguards can be there. My second point is on improving the quality of HR, which is mentioned by, uh, um, in the new economic model. Efforts have been made uh, and uh, as documented in the 12th plan and the assessment of it is that is the issue with the structure, yeah? issue with the structure of the, of the public service. Now we recommended that the Public Services Commission has to see recruitment into the public sector more strategically yeah? and promotion, training, etc. should be towards promoting better talent development. But we are still, our promotion is still based on seniority and we cannot move away because, you know, especially when Tan Sri Sheriff, Sheriff mentioned about the size of the civil service, that is difficult to do also because it is in the constitution. Civil service is defined in the constitution of what it should be and who should be in the civil service. So that makes it very difficult for, for the civil service to transform. My other concern, my other concern is because of budget constraint, that training that many of the senior civil servants in the past have enjoyed may have been compromised due to budget. And yet, in order for us, for civil servants, to, to, to understand the public, the private sector, this interchange of uh, um, uh, personnel from public to private, getting training, getting attachment, and to be global, yeah? Uh, uh, to be trained outside Malaysia, to be working next to the another civil ser uh, service or civil servants in, in, in more advanced countries is, is key uh, in order for us to, act, to, to really understand how is it or what would be the kind of culture, environment, procedures that we need uh, when the country advances to the next level of development. 
My third point is on the, uh, uh, strengthening the national policy framework uh, in economic governance. This is happening already. Yeah? Uh, a lot of efforts have been taken in that regard. But my, my, uh, um, I would suggest that we still may, need to work on policy coordination, that how the main policy yeah, of the um, digitalization plan of the high income economy plan, or, or rather the, the master plan or the 12th plan will have to be followed by all ministries because the interrelationship between the different policies, the different sectors and how they impact each other uh, uh, has to be monitored and has to be seen uh, that they are complementary, uh, they play the complementarity role rather than uh, at opposing uh, with each other. For instance, moving to high income, going, te going to high technology, adopting technology and innovation as opposed to foreign labor. Yeah? So there has to be proper coordination uh, uh, in that regard. And my third point is about uh, fiscal discipline and, and, and reform. Yeah? We are going through difficult times uh, economically, therefore the government will have to come in to support, especially the low income. Therefore, our public expenditure or public budget has increased. However, that's one aspect of public uh, expenditure of our fiscal discipline. The other aspect, which is the revenue side, has not changed. In fact, we, were, we went back. Yeah? When during the, uh, after the introduction of a more generalized tax, which is the GST, our revenue increased. And, but when GST was withdrawn, a problem with fiscal, as mentioned in the new economic model, is that we have a very generalized subsidies, but our net, our uh, tax base, our revenue base is very targeted, very narrow, and that hasn't changed. So um, again, uh, uh, as uh, Ansri Sulaiman and a few others have mentioned that, uh, bringing back the generalized uh, way of collection revenue, or if that is not uh, uh, the way for, for, some, uh, um, for some quarters, there may be a more progressive type of taxation, or both, you know, uh, can be uh, uh, looked at. And the regressivity of the uh, GST was managed, and we can even manage it better. Yeah? So my, um, however, we did mention, we did caution, uh, as uh, Dr. Hamza uh, uh, mentioned as well, that in the new economic model, that there will be uh, two or three uh, um, enablers, or it can be the barriers. The first one is the vested interest. Vested interest can come from anywhere, any group. If we, we in public policy or, or in government is not aware and does not under, un address these uh, um, vested interests, it will be the the, the lock jam or it will be the barrier towards reform. So reform perhaps is not uh, thought at, uh, of as uh, um, revolutionary as transformation. Um, I think in order for us to get the efficient gains, efficiency gains as uh, uh, the Prof. Ye mentioned, perhaps the word that we need to use is transformation because it is also our mindset, and as what Dr. Hamza was saying, what gets here gets us here will not get us uh, forward. Yeah, um, and and that's uh, uh, the the vested interest, and also the political will. The political will, in any reform or transformation, uh, um, evidence have shown that there is, they need to be strong champions, and the champion will have to develop a group of champions. Yeah. So if one person is not enough, but you will have to, to have a group of people that, that, that support you and strong leadership. Um, we recognize that when we were working on the new economic model, the strong leadership will, only, will not just be, have to be at the, cent, at the central level, but also at the lo local level. Yeah? Talking about how, uh, um, about centralization over centralization, and decentralization, as Prof. Ye was talking about, yeah? we know that some city councils yeah, are rich. Some city councils are rich. But uh, although uh, I do agree with Tansri Sheriff as well, that some would need some more support from the government, financial support from the federal government, but some city councils are rich, and yet 
Look at the roads, look at the potholes. Yeah. So um, how do you manage? We, uh, um, I understand that, uh, for instance, in a country like Indonesia, when the local government were uh, uh, decentralized, the local government was competing to see who has the best or the higher savings. So um, this is some of the issues that we have to address. So uh, aligning the local government with what's desired at the central level uh, would be the way, but not necessarily over centralizing. And my, the, the other enabler or second enabler is to prepare the rakyat for change. And I think what happened uh, with the GST was the lack of preparation. Yeah, it was highly politicized. Um, consumers were not empowered. Um, and uh, this is just the, the, the um, we need. We need national dialogue, we need national engagement in order for us to prepare the rakyat if we want to change. And I think change is something that is not a choice. Yeah, uh, uh, especially we are in a way in the um, uh, middle income trap, yeah, upper middle income. Um, uh, the, the, the issue with us, with the uh, reform in Malaysia and especially economic reforms is also the fact that somehow we are blessed. We're always blessed when a crisis happened. And when this crisis happened, and we thought that we can really, you know, go for big reforms uh, and, and change things that we need to change, then the, the, the commodity prices went up. So we are okay again, you know? So, so um, and yet we know that our engine of growth is, is, is not fast, it's old. We need to renew this. And as we warn uh, um, in the new economic model, you know, especially the issue of governance and all that is not handled uh, um, head on, yeah? We will spiral downwards. So uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, um, you know, MIR for inviting me. I think I will just end there. I think our stall is 15 minutes uh, so that we can have uh, discussions after. Thank yeah. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dato. I think you provided uh, continuity between the NEM and towards the current Trump Malaysia plan. I think those, uh, those issues and uh, the, the areas that you highlighted are very pertinent in terms of uh, ensuring that our new reform initiatives uh, take into consideration, especially the, the need for political view, strong champions, strong leadership. All these are soft factors that typically have not been touched upon in, in, in undertaking uh, national level reforms. Uh, uh, and let me apologize for the time uh, overrun, uh, but I think what, what, what we have a final panelist, which is very important because he represents the major stakeholder of public sector reforms, the private sector. So Dato Andy, uh, he's, a, he's a chairman, senior advisor and director of various companies, including multinationals. And he has been involved in uh, various uh, sectors of the economy, industrial sectors, property sectors, as well as educa education sectors, as well, especially in TVET. Across various countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, as well as Southeast Asia. Dato Andy is also the council member of the FMM, Federation of Malaysian Manufacturers, and he chairs the FMM Logistics Committee as well as the National Malaysian National Shippers Council. I think of particular relevance, relevance to this uh, discussion topic today is that uh, Dato Andy is also the co-chair of Bermuda, the special task force to improve the government delivery system. So <laughs> this is right in your area, Dato. So over to you, Dato. Thank you very much. Uh... Good afternoon now, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Dr. Ye, for introducing me. And uh, I would like to also greet a good afternoon to Yang Bermat, uh, Dato Sri Mustafa Muhammad, who is now my co-chair of Pemuda. Uh, alumni of Pemuda, Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mabuk. Uh, you know, formerly he was in our Pemuda. Uh, Ex-team uh, panelist, Tan Sri Muhammad Sharif. Dato Dr. Hamza and Professor Emeritus Dato Noma Manso. Uh, thank you very much for uh, leading the way. Now for me to uh, see whether whatever you say works or not in the private sector. Uh, so I would like actually to uh, recap uh, a certain paper that was produced, uh, uh, brought forward to some uh, by one of my co-chair of Bermuda in 2014. And uh, it says, uh, bridging the gap between the public service and the public it serves. 
Now, uh, of course, uh, I I'm going to touch very briefly on that paper. It, it talks about the significance of the public sector, uh, recognizing the need for consultation, which I think is very important and it is ongoing, uh, a mechanism to be set up for consultation uh, that leads to the evolution of Bermuda. Uh, and also, uh, fast forward, uh, I would like to talk a bit about Bermuda, what we have done, and uh, some uh, advancement in our information technology, especially now that we have a, a digital blueprint through my digital. How do we digitalize and institutionalize some of our process uh, at the public sector level? And uh, and uh, maybe moving forward, uh, I'll mention what is uh, being set up here. We have a my muda now. All right, what is my muda? And uh, I will also. Uh, leave the concluding and the summarization uh, when uh, we are asked to summarize for one minute. That one, I will leave it later, right? Now, I, I think that uh, what I would like to touch on is uh, that, uh, first first of all, I think manners is important. I'd like to thank uh, the organizer for inviting me uh, to speak, right? And uh, this virtual platform also thank uh, the participants for uh, allow, uh, allocating their time to listen. So I hope that to bring this discussion between private sector and the Rakyat perspective on bridging the gap between the public sector and the people it serves uh, when, uh, uh, in the context of a diverse country like Malaysia. Now, the topic we are discussing is very important uh, as there is no doubt that bridging the gap is essential as people are the heart of the development and central to the work of the public sector. Uh, I know that uh, by the turn of the 21st century, right, the GDP spend uh, on a government uh, civil service is maybe around over 40%, and maybe we will be heading towards 50% of our GDP. So a big chunk of this maybe goes to the remuneration and some of the infrastructure costs as well. Right? Now, recognizing the need for consultation, uh, we need to ensure a better match between the, on one hand, the delivery of the quantity and quality of the service given by the resources of the government. And on the other hand, the expectation from the public, right? Uh, especially the, the specific group in, in which I serve will be very much the business community in particular. Uh, and it's challenging for all government. When we talk about all government in Malaysia, we talk about the federal, the state, and the local government. So we have three government, very difficult sometimes to coordinate from our experience in Bermuda, right? And the call by the people is that please consult us, have greater participation, have accountability and transparency, you know, uh, in, in doing what you are, you know, and also continue to increase educating and inform the citizen what you are going to do next, right? Uh, you know, so that we can have a strong civil society, a proper watchdog and a rising governance, especially uh, also rising uh, social media like we have now. People are vocal through the social media. And uh, the Malaysian public sector is one which is rooted very much to the British civil service system. Uh, had been for years basically autocratic in certain ways. And it deliver is when it comes to delivering is uh, delivery services. And that is government and the public service think they know what is best for the people. Uh, this is something that we need to maybe have some mindset change. And this, I, I, I believe, has uh, been something that we are moving away towards uh, by having more consultation. Now, the mechanism of consultation, as mentioned, right, uh, is pushed towards the uh, delivery system. Consultation started with a case of, uh, uh, in, in my my in Bermuda, where the World Bank did a report on public-private dialogue in business regulation reform in May 2020, 2020 uh, World Bank uh, did the evolution of Bermuda, all right? And it says that we started off with the Malaysia Incorporated Policy, that is for consultation during those stage in 1981. Then we have the Malaysia Incorporated Official Committee in 1996. And then the Malaysia Business Council and, and then Bermuda was formed in 2007. Now, which is all close for close, what, which all these are 
uh, calling for a uh, closer cooperation and collaboration between the public and private sector. Now, I could example in the my in the Malaysia Incorporated, it is a system of an ad hoc and an informal consultation between the government and the business community, right? And this was done in the early days, right? Uh, then it became formalized slightly and eventually uh, formalized and established into a Malaysia Incorporated in 1983, where an overall strategy to enhance the public and the private sector relationship and the civil service starts to embark on a new approach to facilitating the private sector, especially in uh, facilitating trade, right? As Malaysia would like to advance from an agricultural base to an industrial base at that time. Uh, so under the Malaysia Inc., uh, we have several directives that set various guidelines to facilitate public-private sector cooperation and consultant. Uh, you know, simple methods like communication, you know, developing administrative circulars were introduced uh, made it mandatory that uh, all uh, government must have consultative panel. And a good example, a uh, notable one is actually a MITI dialogue, for example. Uh, at that time, our Tan Sri Rafida, uh, Yang Baromat uh, Tan Sri Rafida, was the minister and she never failed to engage with industry to find out you know, what are the issues the industry are facing when it comes to uh, doing business with the government. And uh, you know, knowing uh, Tan Sri Rafida, she was very fiery at times. Uh, you know, if we present the wrong thing, uh, the, even the private sector were told off. I have been told off a few times when I went. And I said to her, don't shoot the messenger. I'm only here to bring the issues of the manufacturer. And of course, she also will deal with the uh, government officers, uh, especially cross ministry as well, you know, to get them to buckle up and attend to the issues that have been long standing. Now, fast forward to Bermuda, which is a public-private consultant consultation, which I call it consultation 4.0. We have evolved from number one, number two, number three, number four now. So even for public-private consultation, we are in line with IR 4.0, taking the incorporated, uh, Malaysia incorporated to a higher level. The prime minister established a special task force to facilitate business and Bermuda in 2007 was born. Right? The aim is at creating an effective public-private partnership to improve the business environment and international competitiveness. Uh, we set out to do that and in 2022, which is uh, this year, under the new format of Bermuda, we have revamped it and the uh, co-chair of Bermuda involves uh, Yang Baroma, the minister in the Prime Minister Department of Economy, that is our present minister, uh, Yang Baroma, uh, Mustafa Mohammad. He is now our chair, co-chairing with us, uh, with the chief secretary of the government, the highest civil service, uh, civil servant in the government, and the private sector co-chair from the industry. And at yours truly is at the moment uh, from the uh, industry. Now, the task force comprises a team of highly respected individuals. At that time, we have uh, now we have revamped it to 17 heads of selected government and ministries. Uh, they will be KSU, Director General level and all that, and of uh, ministries and department, and the 12 leaders of the Malaysian uh, uh, business community, right? So some of them are subject matter experts. Some are industry captain uh, of their association and trade association. And uh, we are sharing the best practice of industry with the government. For certain multinational, they might have very good uh, uh, procedures and processes that we think it can be brought into the government and we discuss how it can be done. So very importantly, it is to manage the change, manage the mindset, manage the denial stage sometimes that we may have among ourselves that, you know, uh, this is because of regulation, right? And today, the Secretariat of Bermuda uh, is under MPC. We are very thankful to MPC for providing the platform for Bermuda, for Bermuda to continue in providing at least 40 staffs to serve the various technical working groups uh, in the Secretariat in a more formal manner. Now, MPC has all the trained staff. Uh, they can do the research. Can They can do the regulatory uh, 
what they call the regulatory sandboxing for us. You know, they, that means they experiment certain things. We say, can you please go and simulate a certain thing that this government office is doing? Uh, they will simulate and they will come back with the, uh, 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 you know, the uh, report for us to see whether it works or it doesn't work. Now, in the inaugural meeting of Permuda in 2007, the then the Chief Secretary, uh, Tan Sri Side, uh, he called on the public service to serve all and every segment of the people and adapt the evolving and challenging needs of customers and the nation. Now, the, the SN at that time was one service, one delivery, and no wrong door. Right? He encouraged his to publicize their email address as he had done personally himself so that the people could communicate directly with each other through uh, you know, their personal uh, address or phone. Uh, Bermuda also created online opportunities on his website for the people to register complaints and share proposals to improve the public service delivery. Now, the task force identified issues uh, and areas requiring improving, improvement, and the focus group uh, looks at the whole life cycle of the, doing business. We look at opening a business, operating a business to closing a business. But today we have add on even the cost of living, what is affecting the man on the street. Now we can be having the best position uh, in the World Bank ranking, but if it is not felt by the rugged, that ranking is useless to us, right? So the task force, as mentioned, identify all this. And again, we involve the public and the private sector member uh, we even bring in people who are able to tackle this uh, and they are from the subject matter expert. Now, at the time, we had about 30 such groups, but today we have grown a bit massive now uh, with more and more issues that we need to tackle, especially this pandemic. This two years has taught us a massive lesson about how to deal with a government where we are not able to meet face-to-face -face and where submissions are still required at the front office manually and this is our challenge right so the main force uh, for this permuda is to tackle uh, issues like this now in the 15 years that permuda has uh, uh, started right the improvement in malaysia ranking was from 27 to 12 over 170 and 190 economies respectively but in 2020 world bank doing business report that was babe, the last report that World Bank was producing and we were in the 12th position. Uh, we were aiming towards the 10th position uh, or more uh, or, or less. Uh, you know, of course, uh, there are some very strong economies in front of us. Uh, you know, so this report bears the testimony to the significant outcome that can be achieved when the public and private sector dialogue and collaboration to improve the regulatory and business environment. Now, the World Bank has recognized this public-private sector partnership of Bermuda and uh, the best practice it has recommended to it to other countries. So occasionally, uh, some of our Bermuda members and myself included were invited to Korea, to some other countries, Taiwan and all that to promote what is this Bermuda, you know? And I think this is one of the kind in, uh, in, in this part of the world, right? Uh, especially where we have uh, private sector, which we are willing to contribute pro bono, you know, none of us are paid, right? And I was just joking with our panelists uh, the day before, saying that some of you all have moved from public sector to private sector, whereas I have moved from private sector to public sector, the other way around. So able to understand the whole uh, thinking of the civil service is a great pleasure and a challenge, right? Now, we as a member of the private sector realize the good regulatory governance uh, is equally important for the profitability of our private sector. Thus, Bermuda recognized the need to institutionalize uh, our public-private consultation in the development and implementation of policy. The national policy on the development and implementation of regulation took effect in July 2013. Now, World OECD, OECD said to us that if you would like to move into the first world country and be industrial country, you need to have all this in place. So thus, the KSN took the challenge to get it started. Now, for any changes or introduction of new policies, regulators, regulators are now required to carry out a regulatory impact analysis, which we call REA, on trade, business, and investment, uh, give sufficient notice and carry out extensive consultation with stakeholders. Now, in these stakeholders, we also 
uh, welcome and also need the private sector to send the right people to this consultation. Right? We also told the government, when you invite people, you invite with ample time, not last minute that you would like to read you would like to discuss a regulation and the meeting is tomorrow, for example. So this, this representative may not have time to consult its chamber members or association, all right? And we also say that the individual that attend the regulatory impact, uh, uh, sorry, this private public consultation uh, are not necessarily consulted, okay? And they need to come back in a formal manner to say whether they were consulted or not. Okay, proof of present is not proof of consultation uh, that, uh, that they have agreed. Uh, so this is very important, right? A lot of government servants say, okay, you have attended, your representative attended, you are consulted, you know. So this is bulldozing it, which we feel sometimes is not right, yeah. Now, apart from enhancing the stakeholders' confidence in the regulatory environment, it can also assist in streamlining overlapping regulation as all other regulator, regu regulators with interest would also be consulted, all right? In the early days of Permuda under Tan Sri Sede, the first two years of Permuda, we actually had a guillotine approach to regulations. We chopped off almost 50 uh, unnecessary regulations that are burdensome. We call that, uh, you know, uh, uh, unnecessary regulatory burden uh, on some of the regulation. Some of the regulation there are arcade, and they are there also just to collect small petty revenue that are more expensive to collect than the salary of the civil service and the department it serves, right? So it will ensure require some effort and time for this guideline uh, to be fully adopted. Now, in January 2020, we told the chief secretary, the current chief secretary who launched the chief secretary up to the government, who launched the new national policy on good regulatory practice uh, which is called MPGRP to build on the momentum achieved and is greeted and is geared towards providing clearer and better guidance on uh, guidelines on the adoption of GRP. In this case, we have asked it to be cascaded further to the state, local council as well, and not only hovering at the federal level. So that now we can say that even the local council or any government agency or state agency that would like to increase revenue or increase procedure time costs, uh, they must do a regulatory impact assessment. That means public private consultation must exist. Now, the new policy seeks to ensure new regulation and existing regulation comply with the principle of GRP and the, that the intervention of the government in the economy will bring greater benefits and better outcomes. Ensure that regulations are reviewed as well and relevant, effective, and efficient. Now, I would like to quickly uh, wrap it up by saying that now we have My Digital, which is the advancement into the government information technology. All right. Uh, during the MCO period, the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us an important lesson in dealing with the government, especially the frontline office. Now, digitalizing, uh, digitalizing the process of the frontline with e-submission by doing away with the manual form and physical submission is utmost important, all right? Because at that time, the SOP do not even allow the civil servant uh, to work almost, some of them work only 20%. Uh, so how do you uh, submit some application? So if on the online process, it must be all the way from, you know, online all the way, no hybrid, no, no submission online, then tomorrow you must come with a, hard copy, all right, it must be online all the way with a one-piece flow, all right, even taking account on the, through the payment as well, e-payment, especially making it easy for business and rakyat to pay the mandatory payment like taxes, employment contribution online, all right, during the MCO period, even if we want to pay the government, it was also very difficult, but we are at pressure to pay, otherwise there will be penalties and anyway. Now, equip the government officers that have to work from home with a necessary laptop and computer. Even if officers are armed with the necessary equipment, they also lack the access to the information as some government department system are closed system. For example, the LALAN office, all right? Even though you give them the computer, they cannot access into the registry of the land, all uh, right? Because they're scared that it might be hacked and the information cannot be accessed due to cybersecurity 
Uh, I quoted already the land office. Now, in order for our digitalization program to work and allowing flexibility of working from home for the civil service, we must tackle the internet bandwidth and the speed uh, availability and the availability of them, right? So some areas civil service uh, who lives or even the private sector member are finding it impossible because of the bandwidth keep breaking up, right? Now advances in information technology are making it stronger relationship between citizen and the government possible. Now, Malaysia is making full use of this very important tool in delivery services uh, and in communication to the public. Now, through the launch of My Digital, the Malaysian Digital Economy uh, Blueprint in 2021, this has set the direction of digital economy and built the foundation to drive digitalization across the nation. Now, the effort initiative will be implemented up to 2030. Now, My Digital is designed to complement the national development such as the 12 Malaysian plan. Whole focus in chapter 13 is on policy enabler for strengthening the public service. Now, computerization in delivery service not only will improve efficiency, but also remove the discretion of the human interaction, right? Takes away human action and also have a sense of urgency, which is the mantra of Bermuda and also uh, you know, takes away unnecessary corruptions, right? Uh, very important to ensure a high standard of ethical practice in this. So I would say that uh, we have set up also the one-stop center early on, which is called the Urban Transformation Center, where in certain cities like Melaka, Perak, Kuala Lumpur, Pahang, Sabah, Sarawak, Kedah, and Johor, these are set up with multi-discipline, uh, multi discipline uh, civil service there to provide service even uh, on Sunday as well, right? Now, whether it has worked or not, I, I think that it has to be measured on its performance. But today, like I say, physical offices like this, right? We can do without. I think like any efficiency in any organization, like private sector, we are very particular about the headcount. There were some government office that have actually transformed to digitalization. You know, on one part, you when you see them, you have one part that uses the computer, the other part that are sitting there still doing manual work. So what do we want? You know, we have to put our foot down. We have to decide. If we want to go digitalize, digitalize all the way, all right? Don't be afraid that people will be without job. You know, when I once turn around a company, I say to everyone in the company, in the country, I say within two years, if you don't pick up anything on IT knowledge, you will have no job with this company. Sure enough, right? Even the cleaners have an email address, right? Even the canteen operator also have an email address and they are informed of what is happening in the company. So I will say that uh, the Public Complaint Bureau was also set up in 1971 to deal with complaints made by citizens against the civil service. We have the system Pengurusan Aduan B uh, Awam, CISPA, under the PM. Has it worked? You know, has anybody monitored its pro progress? Now, moving forward, as you can see, the Malaysian government has made significant effort to bridge the gap, and this must be lauded, right? But this journey is not over yet. In fact, it is just beginning. We need to further enhance the public-private sector partnership. We have to complete the computerization journey we have to further increase the level of consultation and participation. We have to strengthen the public debate. We have to ensure new practices introduced are widely inculcated. And we have to enhance accountability and transparency. And we need to uh, cultural transformation of mindset and behavior. Now, coming to the, my last part, the Mai Muda. The government, through the Economic Action Council meeting, agreed on the setting up of a hashtag My Muda initiative in July 2020. Now, it acts as a fast forward solution to address the economic impact of COVID 19. My Muda is an online unified public consultation platform. It is a strategy to improve regulatory quality to mitigate against regulatory challenges being faced by businesses due to the COVID 19 and has since been adapted to also help in achieving national economic recovery in the endemic period. Now, Permuda and MPC are tasked uh, to lead My Muda as My Muda initiative effectively helps in the ease of doing business. On, on the 24th of November, 
2021 yang amat berhormat Prime Minister chat at EAC meeting that decided that My Muda initiative should be strengthened by establishing My Muda unit in all ministries and government agencies as well as in the business association, uh, trade association, private association, uh, professional bodies to holistically facilitate the doing of business worldwide, federal, state and local government. Now, with that, I would like to stop. Uh, thank you very much for allowing me to speak a bit longer. Uh, back to thank you. you. Uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Dato, uh, for very comprehensive coverage of the initiatives that uh, Umuda is uh, undertaking. And then importantly, I think uh, the institu institutionalization of Umuda, I think, is a very important achievement, given that uh, developed economies uh, the quality of institutions actually make a big difference in terms of achieving their what we call developed nation status. So I, we are very encouraged that uh, uh, this uh, Pomuda is, uh, is, is uh, in fact recognized in the region uh, as well as uh, continuing its uh, very important role and functions in, uh, in, in achieving our uh, uh, public-private sector reforms. Perhaps uh, uh, given the time that we have uh, we have exceeded by almost uh, 45 minutes, uh, let me just take the question that is that has been uh, posted, and then we'll go to the roundup <laughs> roundup by uh, by our panelists to provide perhaps uh, uh, some of the key 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 points or key message that you like you like our participants uh, to to consider in, in whether in whatever role they play. Now the question that uh, we have we have received in the post is that what is your take on our public sector capacity? Is it weak, so-so, or high capacity? This is this requires you, requires you to actually rate <laughs> rate how our public sector performance is in terms of its uh, 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 capacity and, and capabilities, and especially in the capacity in performing doing the key tasks of achieving policy goals as well as achieve uh, national development, et cetera. The second question is, of course, uh, the, is the NEM still relevant or we totally have to shift to other reforms such as the whole government approach? So perhaps uh, one minute each to respond to this question, anyone? I'd like to start. Any, uh, what is your take on the public sector Capability of performance. How would you rate it currently? That's an interesting question. Question. Okay. Of course, it's a it's a perception, <laughs> it's a perception issue. But we would like to hear from our panelists to, to respond yeah. to it. Yeah. 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 I can. I can start. Maybe uh, Tansi. I'm not sure. So I just started. Uh, um, well, if you ask me, the public uh, sector capacity. Um, their capability to handle, as I say. Uh, the new economic model, the innovation-driven economy will require new capabilities. As, as I said you know, uh, earlier, the, uh, uh, one progress is here. We have done a great job. And so the capacity of you know, delivering what we had for the last 30 years. But if you look at the last 10 years, 15 years, our economic uh, was just muddling through. More can be done in the delivery of uh, you know investors are not really coming down to the country to as much as we want to. Yeah. Uh, if we look at EDB Singapore, you know I, I hate to take comparison of, of some of the institutional entrepreneurial state type of institution has to be created, but in terms of the you know, uh, running the business as usual, they have done an excellent job. But moving to be to transforming the economy, they have not reached where they should be. Thank you, thank you, Dato. Uh, Tansri, you want to respond to that question? Yeah, Tansri, you are muted. Yeah, Tansri, you have to unmute. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, Tansri, you're on. I think the capacity is there because uh, I do this. Uh, the young generation of civil servants, they are very, they getting more and more well qualified. PhDs, masters, degrees, so they have the capacity. But I think uh, as that too, Dr. Andy Seo was saying, we have to streamline the regulations, simplify the procedures. Uh, however brilliant they are, if the 
regulations are too cumbersome, they can't, they will find it difficult to deliver. I think what Pomuda is doing is great. Uh, and uh, I think it's been used as a model. You know, I was told by when the World Bank wanted to strengthen the administrative system in Indonesia, they say, look at Malaysia, you know, what Pomuda is saying. So I think, uh, um, it shows that with the right leadership, the civil service can change. Thank you. I thought, Norma, you want to respond Thank to the question? Yeah, yeah, I will. I will. I, um, yeah, it is a tough question. Um, we have a fairly good civil service, uh, but as mentioned by the others, that to move the economy forward, uh, we are so used to the way, um, as Andy mentioned, we are very British you know, uh, uh, traditional follow the rule, yeah? Um, so when, when, um, when you are used to that system, it's not easy to, to, to break that. And we do have a great talent coming in as well. But if the ecosystem, for instance, uh, the kind of, of training they get, the culture uh, uh, in, in the service, if it's still uh, performance, uh, uh, is not necessarily the main criteria, but it's the seniority, they get frustrated and they, they probably would leave or they will become one of, one of you know, they just follow the crowd. So um, I think, uh, uh, as I mentioned, that you need that strong leadership, uh, uh, you know, and not at one level, but at a few levels. And you need a group of cadre of uh, um, uh, civil servants who wants change, who wants to create change, who's innovative and entrepreneur, entrepreneurial and all that. But for that group to exist, the ecosystem has to allow that. So something has to be done uh, um, at the fundamental level. Yeah, at the fundamental level. So that, that's my response. Uh, whether NPM is still relevant, uh, NPM is a way of doing of public administration where it is about um, so that decisions are fast and uh, performance are based on key indicators. Yeah, all those are still relevant. Um, but whole of government is in order to, uh, to, 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 to gel everything together that you cannot work in silos because it has to affect everyone. And you have to know who are the people that will, you, will need to be in, in uh, uh, what do you call in align with you in order for you to deliver uh, uh, something. And, and now it's gone beyond the whole of government, it's gone the whole of society, yeah? So the whole society, uh, so bringing in into consultation, getting to them, yeah? So gone were the days when, um, you know, you think you know everything, uh, uh, but I think talking to the people and, and, and but more importantly, I think our field uh, um, workers, our, you know, the, the frontliners, it's interesting that how to a common people, to an ordinary person, you know, how you are treated at the counter is that, that that's what they say the government is. That that's who, whichever federal government is uh, um, currently in power. That is the reflection is by the people who are serving on the ground. So uh, um, again, to echo uh, to Andy's point, is that to both to the to the business and to the common people is reaching out, not, not to wait for them, that, that is what we want, not to wait for them to, you know, to, uh, to come to us because they, they, they have so many constraints, yeah? Uh, in terms of fun, in terms of uh, knowledge, yeah? Transport, etc. cetera. So one, one will have to go out and reach uh, to them. Yeah? So I think that is something that uh, I would add to the discussion. Thank you. Uh, so Dato Andy, from the compared to the past much. and the uh, present, yeah, how do you yeah, how was, do you see the changes? <laughs> well, fifteen years serving Pemuda, and I I believe my the other two co chair from private sector is here, and also serving about uh, the four uh, KSN. You know, uh, the enthusiasm of uh, also in any organization is on the leadership. Uh, leadership by example is very important. For example, uh, dealing with land. Uh, Land matters, for example, which I co-chair uh, since 2007 on improving the land registration in Malaysia. Now, don't forget, land is a revenue to everyone, to the state, to the federal government through RPGT, real property gain tax. And if it, the land has also a premium, right? So why make it so difficult to approve a piece of land where it is a revenue? If you can do it, we've done it. Now, what we have done is we have improved from 144 days 
to register a simple standard property, all right, and to today less than 10 hours, uh, 10 days. In fact, we can do it in one day, all right. You know, we can register. Uh, why? How do we do it? Because we introduced uh, 44, 47 provision to be changed in the National Land Code to allow land administration to be done on Itana. And this wasn't brought by us. It was the Director General at that time of the Land Office who suggests, hey, if you want to improve this, do want us to sign your certificate, do want to make it everything manual. Look, this is your opportunity to help us with this National Land Code. So the initiative of the leadership, because to us, we are not lawyers, we are not every day doing conveyancing lawyers, right? Uh, uh, you know, doing conveyancing. So even the lawyers were the one to tell us, look here, can we do, do less of this, do less of that? Now, everybody wants to have their property. But on the other hand, uh, in 2015, we have the Strata Title Act, which was uh, supposed to uh, improve on our delivery system in terms of property. We are supposed to handle uh, the key to you and the title to you on Strata Title. We blame that there are a lot of old properties until today, 30 years later, 40 years later, have no title. All right. Because why? The management, the developer has gone bust. Okay. So we, in 2015, we make it mandatory. But this system also has, has its flow, uh, as, a, as a flaw there, which is on vacant possession with strata title, which Bermuda is currently handling this, try to get this out of the way. Now, with the new, uh, our co-chair, which is uh, Yambaromat uh, Dato Sri, uh, you know, today our Bermuda meeting is every month. Every month we have a meeting with him and KSN. And every month I also chair the private sector Bermuda. The Permuda, every day there is bound to be a technical working group of Permuda working on some issues. And before the issues are given to the main Permuda, where we would like Permuda to endorse or it may go, uh, KSN can make the decision, it will be made. Uh, Director General level and uh, KSU can make the decision, it will be made. But should it not be made, it will go to the main Permuda. And some of them, they may need a regulate, uh, need it to be brought to the parliament. That is where Yambaromat Minister will help us to bring it out through the Economic Action Council or himself, right? But I will say that we need to strengthen the representative and inclusiveness of the civil service, given Malaysia's multiracial and multicultural background, right? More emphasis could be given to tap on the synergy of the best skill, talents, and experience to reflect the diversity of the people served, which will go a long way to building trust and providing communication or outcome as seen by our people. Why I say that is because today Malaysia is not only about Malaysian. They are foreigners uh, staying here. They are foreigners investing in this country. Uh, you know, looking at all the issues in the region, I think Malaysia is still the best place to invest. We have political stability in the region. You know, we are like favored through our trade uh, trade uh, agreement, like the RCEP and all that, which are yet to kick off properly. You know, we have a great wealth of opportunity, but I would say our civil service need to facilitate by communicating skill is important. So they need to even brush up the commercial language of uh, English, I would say, because a lot of information are in English. Uh, you know, I know that we love to have our documents formed to be in Malay, but Today, some civil service are very sensitive to that. They will have dual, more than dual language, you know. So they are delighting the customer. They are delighting the rakyat by listening to us. What does the rakyat wants? What does the public wants? So they design forms. They design forms uh, to suit the new generation. Today, the civil service are not serving people so much like us. We are institutionalized in our ways of doing things. But today, the youngsters are the ones that are with all the all the, the handphones and all the devices. They are not going to like, they are impatient, I would say. They are a bit of a young person or young man in a hurry. They do not want to fill up all those forms that you ask them to fill up. Don't ask for unnecessary questions or information that you already have. For example, we tell the local council, you are the one that issue us the quick rent and assessment. Why, why do we need to bring a copy when we pay? Why do we need our IC again? You know, so today, government should not ask for information they, they already have. You know, that is why digitalization to us 
it's very, very important. So I would say that we must continue to remove unnecessary regulatory burden, uh, you know, be brave to do a, 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 a guillotine approach. Don't allow rent seekers every time that we improve a system. Sometimes I look at it when we improve a system, you see the failure of my you uh, custom is one big loss to the country. Private sector will engage, consulted. We move two steps forward, three steps back. And today we don't know whether we will ever move forward there to move forward or not. Look, if we improve you custom, custom is also a big revenue collector, right? Why do we, we make it so difficult for people to export their goods? You know, recently we've been tackling markets, for example, the quarantine. They wanted to put back since 2017, the custom prohibition order of 44 units, uh, 44 listed items. That includes our day-to-day -day food, like, you know, baby uh, uh, formulas and all that milk and all that, that you and I consume. Why? It's because they wanted to charge a bit on permit. But when you do not need permit, you do not need any license, we should encourage also faster export of our item. So if the exporting countries do not ask for any quarantine or any unnecessary document, don't try to do their job. This adds on to our cost of business, you know, especially fresh flowers that need to fly immediately from Cameron Highland. Why are we making it so difficult? So even if the government came up with an organized, uh, sorry, an uh, uh, agency like this came up with recently with uh, uh, a government uh, state, uh, what do you call their 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 penyataan, their statement, all right, they are also not clear, very vague. So sometimes we have to teach them, is it because, you know, they, they still frustrate doing business. I mean, if you really have the heart to help industry, go all out to help. Because you are not helping us, you are helping the government. Government is also a shareholders to all our business. And the other thing is local council. We also told them, look here, it is not your job we to to mark, to you know, to undermine the approval of CCC, all right? Okay, because why? The certificate of compliance and certification is issued by the principal submitting person, which is either the architect or the consultant who stick out their neck and they are paid a fee to do the job, all right? So I would like to stop there. Uh, thank, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you. Thank you for a very elaborate response. Thank you. So I think then we have uh, overran our time by almost... Uh, uh, slightly more than an hour. I'm not sure whether we have time to do a, a quick, uh, quick uh, so-called key messages that you'd like to to our online participants to take it take into heart, especially those that are uh, that that are working in the government as well as the private sector. Of course, there's a there's a need for complementary reforms to accompany public sector reforms because that that perhaps uh, MIER can also organize another economics chat. But this time they will need to allocate at least two to three hours. <laughs> so since yeah. Tan Sri Chairman is here, perhaps uh, Tan Sri, you want to do your closing remarks and uh, wrap the wrap up the session, or we can continue with a, a quick a quick round of uh, key messages from our distinguished panelists. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ye and members of the panel. Yeah, we rise up with the occasion. <laughs> you know, uh, the team, the expectation of the are really wonderful discussion we have. Uh, from the four of you. Uh, I was thinking that uh, this could be a beginning of you know, one or two more forums on uh, matters that relate to, to, the, uh, to the public sector. For example, the suggestion by Tansi Sharif, the importance of decentralization. I agree with this very much, very important. And also the all round improvements, innovation emphasized by Dr. Hamza, it is, it is quite important uh, to be, to, you know, to be, uh, to be examined in further detail because uh, some of the uh, some of the machineries and civil service tend to be very archaic, you may say, in the, the change. Uh, as uh, Dr. Dr. Andy said, they are all British. <laughs> they don't talk to change. Uh, and that's not thing. So, and also, uh, Dr. Norma talks about the new model. This is a long standing matter. Uh, and uh, we've got to put this together again because. Um, I'm in the position of the, uh, I'm now in the National Recovery Council. We've got to make sure we have sustained recovery. Not just recovering to the level 
you know, pre, pre pandemic 2019, which was a year decline. Look at before the day, the economy is declining 4.8 for Y.2. So you go back to a lower level, you know, you must go more on that. So what I coined the word as recovery plus plus, and I use that, I get um, we need to mention this in speeches. It means we've not we've got top high quality investments, number one, high productivity, and the other ones in trade expansion of trade creation is very important. To support what uh, Dr. Omar talked about, new trade model. And the role of MIDA to me must be really examined because um, uh, if we still want to contribute, um, uh, you know, uh, just investments per se, namely just uh, labor intensive investments, then these investments uh, are definitely moving towards Indonesia and, 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 and that um, where, where, uh, you know, uh, where labor, labor is still in, in pull, you know. But we are short labor, but we are trained labor force. No, we have 20 universities for another 30 or 40 private colleges and university. They cannot be employed if our, our industries are still remaining at low, low, low level of quality, low technology, and just labor intensity. That's what we've got to move forward. I think it's very important to raise what uh, the NEM is all about and to achieve higher economic growth because uh, we must uh, avoid the traps of mid, uh, middle income trap. It's very difficult to come up. This is a challenge for many other countries, but Malaysia must rise up. It is the only way because we we are we want to share economic growth because we have a fundamental issue facing us inequality. We can only erase address inequality in the context of rapid growth, nothing else, which means productive. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sharif. Thank you very much, Dr. Hamza. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Andy, and also for my good friend, Professor Norma, for, and of course, especially to the chairman. <laughs> a wonderful uh, championship of the function. We may want to have uh, invite you all again. Uh, inshallah, maybe another round, maybe we'll talk just the civil service. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very thank much. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank have you. a good day. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Have a good day. Thank you so much for inviting.